Okay, it's time to start coding to use this raw MoveNet model. So let's get right to it. As before, head back to the tensorflow.js glitch page and find the tensorflow-js-boilerplate project. Remix a new copy of this project that you'll use to write your future code. And for this example, you're going to be starting by editing script.js. So go ahead and open that file on glitch ready to use. I'll wait for you to do that and then click play when you're ready. So this is the minimal code you would need to load the MoveNet model and send a tensor through it to get a prediction. Let's walk through it and feel free to follow along on Glitch as you go through. Now, just like in the prior section of the course, you start by defining the location of the model you wish to use. In this instance, you use the URL copied from TF Hub. You can also define a variable called MoveNet, which you'll use to hold the loaded model once it's ready. Again, as TensorFlow.js uses a lot of asynchronous calls, it's wise to create an async function to do all the work. Here, you create a function named load and run model and call it right away at the end of the code on the last line. Diving into the function, you can call await tf.loadgraph model and pass to it the model path of the model desired, along with the special tfhub configuration object. This lets TensorFlow.js know that you're trying to load a model from tfhub and only needs to be specified when using a model hosted on the tfhub platform itself. On the next line, you can use a neat trick to create an example tensor filled with dummy values of a shape and data type required. And we can do this before hooking up to real images that will need processing, and this can allow you to quickly check everything is working correctly. Here, you can call tf.zeros, which will create a tensor just filled with zeros. You specify the shape, which is the same shape as defined in the MoveNet documentation for what it expects as an input, which was 1, 192, 192.3. Finally, you can also specify the D-type, which MoveNet documentation specified should be int32. This essentially represents a pure black image that is 192 by 192 pixels in size. Next, you can call the predict method of the model as you're used to and pass it the input tensor you wish the model to process. Once a prediction comes back, you can get the raw array data that was returned in the correct output shape by calling the array function on the output tensor that was created. Note the act of fetching data from the tensor's memory itself is an asynchronous call, so you must use the await keyword here as shown. Finally, you can console.log the array to inspect what came back from the prediction. And if you run the code in its current form, you'll see the following log to the output. Here you can see there's an array containing an array, which itself contains an array of 17 elements, which contains an array of three elements, which as you know, represent the Y, X and confidence values respectively. The other thing to note at this point is that you just sent the model a completely black image, yet it still somehow predicted 17 key points of where it thinks it sees a human pose. It's important to note that the machine learning model will always give you an output, even if the input doesn't contain the thing you want. And in this case, if you look at the confidence scores for all of the key points, you can see that they're very, very low. Here, all of them are under a score of 0.07, which represents a confidence of 7% or less, as the maximum value it could be is 1. It's up to you as a developer to decide what is too low and to ignore such results if they don't seem appropriate. Okay, so you've got results coming back and you know from the documentation how to interpret them, but so far all you've done is sent a bunch of zeros through the model. How can you send a real image? Well, as always, before you look elsewhere, it's wise to check the TensorFlow.js API as there's likely a function that can help you. Here you can see under the browser section, there's a tf.browser.fromPixels function that you can call to create a tensor 3D from a given image. Even better, the image can come from a variety of image-like elements, such as a HTML image, canvas, or even a video element. So first, you need an image to use. I've gone ahead and uploaded an image that you can use for this tutorial that's also hosted correctly, so it will work across domains. And on that note, any image you want to use needs to have the cause header set correctly on your web server so that it can be used on the front end without issue. If you host a file without setting these headers correctly, you might see a message stating that your canvas has been tainted like the one shown here. 
If your image is served on the same domain as your front-end code, then this will not be an issue, but this is something to watch out for if you use images hosted from other domains, as you'll be doing in this example. Okay, so next you'll modify the HTML code to add an image to the web page. Okay, so first edit the body of your index.html page to add the example image as shown. Here you'll give an image an ID of example image, force a width and height of 640 and 360 pixels respectively, and specify the cross origin attribute to avoid cause issues. And finally, set the source attribute to point to the JPEG image as shown. If you updated the HTML correctly and view your live preview, you should now see a web page that looks something like this with the image showing. Now it's time to head back and continue editing the JavaScript within script.js. Now that you've got an image available on the web page to use, update your code to grab a reference to that image. Here you can call document.getElementById and pass to it the ID of the HTML element you want to grab a reference to, which in this case is example image that you just added to the HTML page. This reference will be stored as a constant named example underscore image as shown. Next, you can use tf.browser.fromPixels and pass to it the example underscore image constant you just created to create a new tensor, which you'll call image tensor. Finally, you can console.log the resulting tensor shape to check what it looks like. Now, if you check the console after running the updated code, the first item printed will now be the shape of the image tensor you just created. Here you can see that it returns a shape of 360 by 640 by 3 for the image that you added to the HTML, which seems correct as you specified the width to be 640 pixels and the height to be 360 pixels in the HTML markup. Now one thing to note here is that the convention for loading images in TensorFlow is to list the height first and then the width second, which is why the shape of the tensor returned by from pixels has the axis sizes shown in this order. Now, as a web engineer, I would have expected the first two sizes to be the other way around, as you typically deal with width and then height when using something like a HTML canvas. So be careful this does not cause shape mismatch issues for you in the future, and if unsure, always print the shape to check what you're actually dealing with at any point in running the code in the program. Now, on the subject of shape mismatches, the MoveNet model requires an input of 1, 192, 192, 3, and currently you've got a shape of 360, 640 by 3. The time has come where you need to crop and resize the image accordingly to match the shape required. Thankfully, the TensorFlow.js library has functions for that, and because you're dealing with tensors, manipulating all of those numbers will be really, really fast. Now, as with any challenge, there's always many ways to solve a problem like this. And if the image is large enough, you could choose to simply crop the image, but that would cause the loss of some pixel data, which might be acceptable if you don't need to use it. Alternatively, you can resize the image, and there are two key ways to resize an image using the TensorFlow.js APIs. The first way is to use resize by linear, which is the most common way to resize an image. To put it in terms of graphics editing, if you were to take a small image, and resize to be larger using this method, the resulting image would be smooth but blurry, as you can see from the above example. The second way is to resize nearest neighbor. This method is useful for when the specific pixel values of an image should not be interpolated, creating new values that never existed before. This instead creates more pixelated images as you see here, but the colors are preserved. As the aspect ratios of the original image and the input tensor image are different, a simple resize would cause the stretching of the image. Here, your original input image is a rectangle and the input to the model is a square. You must now address if you want to stretch the image or not. So here is a rectangular image on the left-hand side and you need to turn it into a square image. You've got three options. First, you could stretch it in both dimensions to become the new size and aspect ratio. Second, you can maintain the aspect ratio and fill any leftover pixels with say a different color, maybe black. And finally, you could crop part of the image of interest to be of the correct aspect ratio and then simply resize that. Here you can visually see the differences between these three approaches. So what should you choose? Well, if the aspect ratios of the final image and the original image are fairly similar, you might be able to get away with some small distortion without affecting the model's ability to classify objects in the image. 
If there's a huge difference, like you have in this face example, then the image may be so distorted that the model will find it unusable, as it wasn't trained on images that look like that. Now for this tutorial, you'll learn how to crop an image tensor and then resize it. So let's get to it. Looking at the original image, there are many ways you could crop an image to get a resulting square image as shown here. Now clearly, if you use the crop on the right, the human's not even contained in the image, but it should be really bad. Using the crop on the left would be preferred as it's just big enough to cover the human in the image, which is what you want to perform the pose recognition on. Now, do you remember a pre-made model that you used before that could detect the bounding box for common objects in an image like a human? Yep, that SSD model could actually be used here to allow you to crop the image to provide a more optimal input image for MoveNet to take as an input. And as you can see, pre-processing can actually itself involve other ML models to get the best inputs to more complex models like this MoveNet model. In the name of keeping the example code shorter, let's pretend you've already used the Coco SSD model to find where the person is in the current image shown. Now, this is great, but the bounding box is a rectangle and you need a square. In this case, you can simply expand the width of the found bounding box from the center outwards to match the height size, and now you've got yourself a square. Now this square bounding box will have a top left position, in this case, an X position of say 170 and a Y position of 15. And the bounding box also has a size, which is its width and height. As this is a square, both are gonna be 345 pixels in size in this case. You now have the data required to crop the image to a square form. Okay, so let's go ahead and code up everything you just learnt. Start by creating an array to define the crop starting point in the image tensor you previously created on the prior lines of code. Now remember that an RGB image tensor is rank 3, so your starting point will actually be a coordinate in 3D space. The first value in this array will be the starting Y coordinate, and the second value will be the starting X coordinate. And then finally, the third represents the starting color channel, in this case red, as we want to retain all color data for the cropped pixels. Next, you can define the crop size. As you saw from the crop defined, the square you want will be 345 pixels in size. As such, the first element of this array will be 345 to represent the height, and then the second will be also 345 to represent the width. Finally, you want to crop across all of the color channels so that you don't lose any information of which there are three in total, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. So the final value in this array will be three. Next, you can perform the crop. Here, you can simply use tf.slice and pass to it the image tensor that you want to perform the crop on, the crop starting point, and then the crop size, which you just defined. This will return a tensor of the smaller crop size, and you can store this in a variable called cropped tensor. So now you've got a square tensor that is of size 345, 345 by three. All that's left to do now is to resize it to be the correct input size that the MoveNet model expects. Here, you can use the tf.image.resizeByLinear function that you learned about in the previous section. It simply takes three parameters. First, the image tensor that you're trying to resize, in this case, the newly cropped tensor that you just created. Second, the new shape of the image. In this case, you want it to be 192 by 192 pixels in size, which is represented by a one dimensional array with those values contained inside it. Finally, the third parameter specifies something called align corners. This is an optional property that defines how the corner pixels are treated when scaling them, and it's recommended to set this to be true. Once that resize is performed, you can cast all the numbers contained in the tensor to be an integer using the two int method. You need to do this as MoveNet expects inputs to be integers, not floating point. Okay, so next you can print the shape of the resulting tensor to ensure everything worked as expected. It should print 192.192.3 to the console at this point. Finally, you can now pass the resize tensor to the MoveNet predict function. However, there's one last thing you must do. MoveNet expects a batch of one to be passed which would have the shape 1192192 by 3. Thankfully, there's a handy TensorFlow.js function to expand your TensorFlow's dimensions into this form. Here, you can call 
tf.expanddims on your resize tensor, and the result of this would be the correct size to be passed as an input. If you run the code in its current state, you'll get some output that looks like the one shown in the console. Taking the first element in the 17 item array, you already know that this represents the nose on the human in the image. Here, it estimates that the y and x position of the nose to be about 0.08 and 0.49, which represents 8% from the top in the y axis and 49% from the left on the x axis in the original image. Now multiplying each of these by 192, which is the square size of the input tensor to the MoveNet model, and then swapping them to be in the form of xy instead of yx, you get the coordinate of 94, 15. Plotting this point on the cropped input image gives the location shown on the right, which seems pretty correct to me given that this point represents the nose. You can also see it's about 58% sure that it plotted that point correctly, which is useful to know. Finally, plotting the rest of the 17 points gives you the following image. All that's left to do now is to take these found locations on the square image and transform them back to the location in the rectangular image you started with. As you know, the starting crop point in the original image of 170 by 15, and that original width and height of the crop was 345 pixels before you resized it, you can multiply the found normalized X and Y coordinates that were predicted by the MoveNet model by 345, and then add those resulting X, Y coordinates to the crop start position in the original image as shown here to overlay the points perfectly. Of course, don't forget to dispose all of the tensors you created once you're done using them. As you've seen, more advanced models need more pre-processing to take some input data and get it into the form that the model can digest. This work is not trivial and it can take time to do efficiently, which is why the TensorFlow.js team provides easy to use classes that do all of this work for you. Now, if you plan on using the MoveNet model in the real world, I highly recommend you use the optimized TensorFlow.js class that allows you to use it in just a few lines of code, and there's a lot more behind the scenes to make it run very efficiently too. But now, you've got the knowledge to make machine learning models more accessible to others, and I hope that with this knowledge, you'll be able to take other models out there as they come out and make them easier for your peers to use and access who might not have taken this course before. And with that, I'll see you in the next section.